Yeah, you really, I think that that's a mistake. I think that you really need, um, the Mishnah is really the core building block to the Talmud. Um, and so we're going to make sure, we're going to make sure that we build that building block today. Um, so Beverly, I see in the chat, you're already asking, can I give you a quick overview of the Talmud and the various things? Yes, that's what you're getting in this class. So don't worry, I'm not going to do it this second, but I promise you, um, we have two goals for this session today. One is, I'm hoping for those of you that this is a refresher, it'll be a good refresher for those of you um, that, that are learning this for the first time. I'm hoping that you're going to come away. We're not only going to be looking at the Mishnah today, actually in this one action pack session, and a piece from the Yerushalmi Talmud, and a piece from the Babylonian Talmud, and we're going to do all that in one session. And so the goal for this session is twofold. One, that you'll come away from this session with a better sense of what are all those things that I just said. So if right now those are confusing words, that's totally fine. By the end of it, you're going to know what is the Mishnah? How is it different than the Tosefta? What is the Talmud? Is it the Gemara? What is the Yerushalmi Talmud? What is the Babylonian Talmud? So you'll know what all of those are. But we're going to you're going to learn that information by actually learning those texts. We're actually going to dive into a central question of the text. So the question that we're going to be asking today is, um, we're really going to be asking a very important question, which is what is the essential nature of prayer? What is prayer all about? But the way that we're going to answer that question, what is prayer all about? The way that we're going to get at it is by asking a very specific halachic question, a specific legal question. And so the question there is, does it matter what language we pray in? Or are certain prayers, can they only be said in Hebrew versus are there other prayers that we could be said in any language? Which may seem like on the face of it, you know, an unimportant question or a halachic question, it's a legal question, but actually the whether what you feel is the essential nature of prayer how you would answer the question what is happening when we pray what is the main value of prayer will affect your answer to whether or not you can pray in a language other than hebrew okay so we'll flesh that out a little bit later um but that's basically what we're going to be doing and so this is the first part of really three sessions in which we're going to be tracking that question um what is the language of prayer what is the essential nature of prayer? Can I play, pray only in Hebrew or can I pray in a language other than Hebrew? Are there certain prayers that I can only pray in some languages? We're gonna be tracking that question, starting with the Mishnah, because you have to start with the Mishnah because you can't jump to the Talmud. You need to start with the Mishnah because that's the, the, the founding block. We're gonna see what the Mishnah says about it. And then the Gemara, we're gonna go to the, the Talmud to build on top of the Mishnah to see how the rabbis of the Talmud treat it. That's gonna be this session, the first session. And then next week, we're going to be continuing on to the group of rabbis that are called the Rishonim. So Rishonim coming from the word Rishon, or first. They weren't really the first rabbis, but by Rishonim, we mean earlier rabbis relative to the, the later rabbis. So Rishonim is the period of rabbis between 1000 and 1500 CE. So we're going to see, okay, today we're looking at the Mishnah and Talmud, but we're going to see in next week's class, well then what do those Rishonim rabbis from 1000 to 1500 CE, how do they answer the question of the language of prayer? How do they build on the conversations and discussions that we're going to see today? Where do they differ from it? And then in the third and final session, we're going to be looking at the Achronim. So Achronim coming from the word Acharon, which is last, again, they're not really the last rabbis because we're here today, there are still rabbis after that, but achronim sort of meaning the later group of rabbis. The achronim is generally the rabbis from between, let's say, um, you know, the 1500s even until, to, I would say, 18, 1900s would fit into that category. Um, we're going to see how they respond to that question of what is the language of prayer, what is essentially happening when we pray, what are the values at stake, um, and we'll be looking in the third section, we'll be looking at major Jewish law codes like the Shulchan Aruch, we'll be looking at the Tor, we'll be looking at response literature. Again, if all these words are just words to you right now, that's okay, because we're going to get to them in due time. Um, the goal of these three sessions is going to be for you to get a sampling of all of these, do these different Jewish texts. You'll come away knowing a lot more of these key rabbis, these key texts, but we're going to do it by actually engaging the material and looking at the question of what is the essential nature of prayer? What are the values? What, what is happening when we pray? And then how does that influence what language it is permissible to pray in? So those are our goals for this class. Um, before we actually dive into the Mishnah though, 
I actually want to continue. Um, you thought that we were leaving behind Parshat Noach entirely to go into Halakha land, to go into Jewish law land, but actually I want to start with the Torah. Um, there's a sense, um, Ara, you were saying you, you guys jumped to the Talmud, um, and really, you, I was saying you have to start with the Mishnah, but really a lot of times even when you start with the Mishnah, you have to go back further, because really, if you want to be looking at where the law is coming from, you've got to go to the Torah. And so I want to ground the learning that we're doing today in the Torah um, that actually comes in, um, follows up on the learning we were doing for the past two weeks. We were looking at the story of the flood. We were looking at Parshat Noah. Um, and what happens after the flood? Noah comes out of the, out of the ark. All the world is um, basically destroyed, unrecognizable. And then in just a few um, chapters later, what happens? Suddenly civilization has rebuilt itself. There's all these people. Um, they're all speaking the same language. And they together get together to do this project called building the Tower of Babel. Okay, so I want to ground us in the Torah. We're going to read the story. Can I actually ask, I know this is untraditional for this format. I would, you're going to be hearing my voice a lot today. I would love to ask for a volunteer to read my favorite story that's only like 11 verses. It's not a big commitment to read the story um, of the Tower of Babel and the Torah. What If you raise your hand and let me know, I'll be able to unmute you so that you can. Um, oh, it right, looks like Lin, Lind, Lindy, you're volunteering for us. Amazing. Thank you much. Susan, I appreciate your hand. I'm going to go to Lindy, but I want to just acknowledge both of you for being such quick volunteers and not making me wait two minutes for that. I really appreciate it. Okay, so Lindy, let's see if I can go. I'll ask you to unmute so that you'll be able to. Okay, are, you that works. Put, are you putting it up on the screen? And I'm going to put it up on the screen right now. Okay, good. So I'm going to go into a screen sharing mode and I'll make it nice and big so hopefully we can all see it. Okay, just give me a second, Lindy. I'll get it so it's bigger. It's easier for you to read. Can you see that okay, Lindy? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. Okay, Amy, amazing. Right? Yeah, and of course, here. please, please. Okay. Everyone on Earth had the same language and the same words. As they migrated from east, they came upon a valley in the land of Shinir and settled there. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them hard. Brick served him as stone, and bitumen, bitumen served as mortar. And they said, come, let us build a city and a tower with its top in the sky to make a name for ourselves, else we shall be scattered all over the world. Interesting. The Lord came down to look at the city that, and the tower that man had built, and the Lord said, if, as one people with one language for all of this, this is how they have begun to act then nothing that they may propose to do will be out of their reach. Let us then go down and confound their speech so they shall not, and you need to. There you go. So they shall not understand one another's speech. Thus the Lord scattered them from uh, there from all over the face of the earth and they stopped building the city. This is why it was called, this is why it was called Babel because there the Lord confounded the speech of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. The whole Lindy, that was a great reading. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, so something, I just love this story so much for a lot of different reasons. One, I just want to spell out for you, um, why is it called Babel? It comes from um, like Mevubal or um, Lebavel, but it comes from to confuse. So the idea is it's called Babel because it's literally the tower of confusion. It's a place where um, they were all speaking the same language, working on the same plan, and then God came down and confused all of them, confounded all of them, made them all speak different languages so that they could no, no longer work on the project together. Um, I think this is an incredible story because it's such really a confusing story. It's a confounding story. Um, it always sort of feels like on first read, it starts out so great. The people are working together. They're in unity, same language, same project. Um, and then God seems unhappy, you know, God is threatened by that or something. And whatever it is, God scatters them. Um, and there feels to me on first read something very sad about this project of God scattering them, God making it so that they can no longer communicate with each other um, and sort of confounding, confounding this whole project of unity that was happening. It's hard to understand. Um, one of the reads of the story, so going back to the world from last week, going back to the world of the commentators um, and, the, and the world of the Midrashim, the interpretations. So this story was confounding also to the rabbis. The rabbis, you know, said to themselves, 
it sounds so good. Same language, same project working together. Isn't this what we want people to be doing? Um, so it asks the question, dear Shuni, the text demands an answer of if it was so good, if they were all working together, then why did God scatter them? Why did God make it so they all spoke different languages? And so some of the answers that they give there, one answer is um, because they only cared about the project. They only cared about um, the tower. And even if like a person died while they were building, they just would build into that person's body. That body would become a part of the mortar because they all they cared about was building up and they didn't care if you know the um, the Dr. Seuss story, Yurgle the Turtle. It's an amazing, I recommend it if you have grandkids or kids, it's an amazing parallel to the Tower of Babel, but Yurgle the Turtle, the turtle who only cares about being the highest turtle and he's stepping on all the other turtles' backs. That was basically how the rabbis understood Babel, that the people were just building and climbing on top of each other. And if someone um, didn't make it, you know, they didn't care. They, it was just another body. That was sort of one idea. Um, another read on the story that I find very powerful is that it's really, um, this is a story about um, conformity. Um, and a story about power in which that there was, it wasn't that it was that everyone was speaking the same language, but it was that actually everyone was being forced to speak the same language. Everyone was being forced to conform. There was no space for difference. There was no space for diversity. And so God being a God that values diversity and being a God that values people being created and each, each person being unique, that there's no, there's no two people that are the same. God sees this um, push towards conformity, conformity, that everyone has to be the same, and that's actually what God's confounding. And so in that read of the story, it's not that God doesn't like that we're working together, it's that it's a God that's reacting to a world in which everyone has to be the same, and there's no room for, there's no room for difference. And so really there, the value is, um, is that at the end, when they come out, we might have thought, isn't it so nice? Isn't the ultimate goal? that we should all be speaking the same language. And at the end of the story, it's actually no, perhaps the ultimate goal is that we all speak different languages because that speaks to difference. That speaks to um, you know, each one of us having their own identity. And so at going back to the question of prayer, and then I wanna take a moment to hear your questions in the chat, to hear your responses in this story. Um, you can already see in this story, the tensions in prayer. Do we care about a society, do we, what is the ultimate value in society? A society where everyone speaks the same language or a society in which there are a lot of different languages and in which diversity is valued? Do we want a society in which everyone is praying in the same language and you have to pray in this one language, the holy language of Hebrew? Or do we want a society in which prayer can look really different? Um, there are different prayers, there's different languages for prayers. Um, and the diversity that seems to be upheld by story actually makes its way into our prayer. Okay, so I wanna stop now and look to the chat. Feel free to respond to anything I just said. Um, so Jeff said, did the tower become an idol? What happens when one goes east? Yeah, Jeff, that is a, an interesting idea of viewing the tower um, sort of as like the ultimate big idol of this thing that they were coming to worship, the building of the thing itself, sort of the monumental size. I think that there's a sense in which that makes a lot of sense. Lindy says they actually spoke what became their fate. They said they would be scattered if they did not build it. And in the end, they were scattered, which is so ironic. I'm trying to think, Lindy, about how that relates to the question, how, like, if I, I, it's so ironic that that happens in the story, and I'm trying to think that, play that out about the language, that actually, like, we think that, we think that, we think that forcing conformity or making us all speak the same language will be the thing that keeps us on the same page, but actually, perhaps it's forcing everyone to speak the same language, perhaps even to pray in the same language, might be the reason why we end up being scattered in the end. I'm not making that claim. I'm not coming down on praying in Hebrew or not in Hebrew right now, but I'm just trying to think, Lindy, it's powerful what you're saying. I'm trying to think how that actually plays out um, in relating to what language we pray in. Arnold says, God says, come close to me, but not so close that you try to replace me. Yeah, that's another great read on the story that, that perhaps the fear is, um, that there is a, another read on that, Arnold, um, is that there's the hubris in the story of we're going to build a tower. This is very much Yurtle the Turtle. We're going to build a tower that touches the sky, um, where the, the heavens being where God is, that rivals the place of God. Susan says, is it like Eden, where God doesn't want mankind to have too much power, right? So that sort of connects to the way Arnold was understanding it. Lindy said, 
they would have all been the same and no individuality allowed, right? And so the end of the story in that read is really affirming difference, affirming individuality, affirming the importance of having all these different languages. But then it raises the question, if the story is affirming diversity, affirming the diversity of language, then what does that say about prayer? Once we have all these, we have all these different languages because God wanted us to have that diversity in language. And then how does that affect our prayer life? Do we then go all back to praying in the one same language? Do we pray in the language that we understand? Howard says, it seems to me that throughout the Chumash, God is continually being surprised and confounded, good word, Howard, by the consequences of having granted humanity free will. God keeps trying to put limitations on the scope of that will, but it keeps leaking out and finding ways to continue to frustrate God. God seems in the battle story to value diversity only because it limits the scope of humanity's will. It's interesting. Um, so Marion says, if nothing's out of their reach, do they no longer need God? Yeah, so that's powerful. That's sort of going along with what Arnold was saying, that reaching up. Mimi, for prayer to be meaningful, the person must use words or non-words that are meaningful to him. Okay, so Mimi, we're going to see this exactly in one of the texts that we're going to look at, your language here. And so I want to come back to it, the idea of, so the, Mimi, you're already starting to answer the question of, which I want to ask you in a moment. So Mimi is starting to get us to think, and I want you guys to th start thinking about it. For you, what do you feel like is most important about prayer? What is prayer essentially about? Mimi, it sounds like you're saying part of what's really important about prayer is that the prayer has to be meaningful to the person who's saying it, that seems pretty reasonable, right? And that if a person doesn't understand what they're saying or they're using a language that that's, there's not their own, that, that there's going to be a disconnect between the prayer and the person who's praying. And so maybe saying that the person has to use a language that they understand, that they connect to. Um, and Mimi, I appreciate that you're adding and we're going to be focusing a lot on words and language, but I very much appreciate that you're saying that actually not all prayer has to be through language. It could be through nonverbal communication as well. Okay, I'm just looking. Um, Good. Okay, so I, I just want to acknowledge, I see your other comments and I really appreciate them. I'm not going to read out everyone's comments, but I'm glad that you're making them so that you, you, um, each of you are seeing them. Um, so just thinking about how does, how does the story of Babel um, play out into the conversation around language? Um, it could be, and I hope that this is not the case for us, it could be that in the next three sessions, you're going to feel like if you're really into Jewish law and minutia of Jewish law, then you're going to love the next three sessions. If you're less into that, if this is less your comfort zone, it could be that you're going to be like, okay, enough of all the like slicing and dicing this question about what language we pray in already. Um, and But I, what, what I want to argue is, is that actually the question of where the various commentators, where the various rabbis fall out on um, can you pray in Hebrew? Can you pray in other languages? What languages? What prayers? In what way? That it's not just a halachic, a legal question to be dismissed, that actually at the core of it is they're arguing over really important values, and the values are what is essential in prayer? What is prayer all about? Okay, so some of those values that I just want to put on the table for you are, if we really care about community, if you want to say that what is prayer about, it's about the community coming together, both the community that you're in, connecting to communities across the world, connecting to communities throughout time, feeling like when I pray, it's not only going horizontally, but it's going sort of like backwards in time and forward in time, then maybe I'm going to argue if prayer is really about community, then maybe I want to argue that prayer all has to be in the same language so that we're all connecting to that same sense of community. If I want to argue that prayer is really about a person's individual relationship to God, then maybe I want to argue that prayer should be um, in the language of the individual, whatever language I, as the prayer, understand best, right? How can prayer be about my individual relationship to God if, as Mimi was saying, I don't understand the words I'm saying or those words aren't meaningful to me? So depending on what you think when you show up to shul or when you not even show up to shul, when you pray to God in your bedroom, depending on what you think prayer is about, it might affect what language you pray in. Or it could be that you want to argue, well, the shema, is about, I'm just, I'm just making a claim, I'm not standing by this. You might say the Shema, right? The prayer, the one-liner that you learn as a kid, the prayer that you're supposed to say as you're dying, like this is, you might say like, well, that prayer, the Shema, that is tying us into all community, that's gotta be in Hebrew, but maybe the Amidah, so the Amidah is the personal individual prayer, the standing prayer that we say where we lay out our request before God. Maybe the Amidah can be in our own personal language. Then you might start to say different, you know, in different prayers, you might prioritize 
different values. But the question of what language to pray in, um, as we're going to see in these legal texts, they're not just arguing some sort of like legal minutia. There's actually really deep values at stake for them. Okay, so now I want to throw it back to you. I'd love to hear just responses to everything that I just put before you in terms of what do you think are some of the different values that might be competing in prayer and language? Um, or sort of the more open question is, what do you think prayer is all about? When you pray or when you don't pray, what do you think the project of prayer is all about? And then how might that affect what language you think we should pray in? Just go ahead and put that into the chat. Um, and I'll just ask if you if you keep your if your comments are private to me, then I'm not going to assume I should read them out loud. But if you address your comments to everyone, then I'll assume it's okay for me to share them with the group, just so you know. So if I'm if you sent your comments to me privately and I don't read them out loud, it's because they were private. So I didn't know if you wanted me to share them. David, I'm interested to hear more about what you meant by, are we more responsible to ourselves or to others? If I had to play out what I think you were saying, but I want to hear what you're saying, is if we're more responsible to ourselves, then maybe what is prayer about? Is it, is it about ourselves? Is it about our community? Is it about others? Um, and depending on how we might answer that, it might affect the language we're praying. And if prayer is really about um, me and myself, then maybe I'm going to dive in, in the language I understand that I choose. If prayer is really about my responsibilities to other people, that might actually affect, maybe there's a communal language. Ellen says, prayer is a form of meditation, of self-realization, of retrospective thought. It's beautiful, Ellen. That says delving into ourselves. Okay, good, David, I got what you were saying. Amazing. Yeah, so Ellen, I'm curious, I can guess again, um, Ellen and Beth, my guess, if I had to read into your responses, I would ask you then next, okay, so then what, how does that affect what language, what you would say about the question. If you were the legal commentator is what language can you pray or not pray in? I would guess, Ellen and Beth, that you might argue that it's important to pray in the language that you understand, that that's the value because it's about going into yourself. So Ari says, prayer has both components, an individual and a communal, two sides of one coin, right? So Ari, you nailed it, which is exactly right. We see this in our literature all the time is that prayer is very much about the individual and the communal. The Amidah, this the Amidah is a great example. The Amidah is the individual silent prayer that we stand to pray, that you can pray at loan, you don't need a minion. And yet there's certain parts of the Amidah that you can only say um, when you are in a group of 10 people, when you have the community to come together, um, even like thinking about our um, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur liturgy, on one hand, you're doing tshuva, you're making atonement for your own individual sins, but the language of that is all in the we. We did this, we sinned. Um, and so there, I think therein Ari embodies sort of the, the, the tension in prayer, is prayer essentially an individual experience? where you can pray in whatever language you want because it's about your needs, your relationship to God, or is it a communal experience that's connecting you to the community and therefore there actually might be a pull on what language you're praying in. Sheila, I love, um, I really appreciate people that keep pulling me back into prayer as beyond words. Again, I'm focusing on words just because that's what the texts are, but I think that you are all so right. Um, Sheila is saying, I'm not sure that prayer only exists in words, also art, dance, music, always I pray, and simply being in nature. Um, Sheila, again, I wonder, given that you're saying that prayer can be beyond words, I could see either that you might say prayers are beyond words. If prayer is beyond words, then I wonder what that implies about the language of the prayer. If prayer is beyond words, then maybe there's a sense in which the language of the prayer doesn't matter, and it should just be Hebrew, because it's sort of not about the words. It's about, it could be about all these other experiences. Or maybe, Sheila, you would say, well, if I'm also able to pray through art and dance and music, maybe prayer that is about a fixed liturgy, that should stay fixed in Hebrew. You could play it out different ways. Cindy says, to me, it seems that the language of prayer is dependent on the type of prayer. Ah, Cindy, this is exactly going to be in a text, so thank you so much. When praying for healing, that's more community-oriented and should be in a common language. When praying individually, 
the language of prayer can be more fluent and in one's more in one's fluent language. Okay, good. So Cindy, I just want you to remember you said this. And when we see it in a text, I want to come back to you to see what you think about this. So um, Cindy is saying, A, that it might depend on the type of prayer and actually the nature of the prayer. Um, and Cindy seems to be breaking it down and say prayer that is more um, community oriented should be in the common language, the communal language, whereas prayer that is individual might be just in one's fluent language. So communal is in the shared common language of Hebrew, presumably. I think, Cindy, I'm not sure if you would go that far, but I think, I assume that's what you're saying. Um, an individual could be in your own personal language. So we'll come back to that. Ellen is saying sometimes the language of it, it's really just the familiar sound of a mantra, which I find very much with prayer. Okay, all of your comments are so beautiful. I'm not reading them all out, but I really hope that you're all reading them yourselves. Jeff says, does prayer also occur through instrumental music? If so, is this a universal language that we can then translate into our own individual words or imagery? I like the idea of there a universal language that we're then translating for ourselves. Wow, I'm overwhelmed by the depth of your comments and also the need to continue with the sources. I'm gonna read a couple of more and then I'm gonna move on. I just wanna reemphasize really appreciating all of your comments, even if I'm not reading them out loud. I hope that you're all reading each other's. Norman says, prayer is by definition in different languages. In fact, it is in individual languages. Prayer is personal. Each person has their own conversation with God. Each person understands God, prayer, and religion in their own understanding, beliefs, and values. Even if two people pray in the same nominal language, each of their understanding is an experience and so personal that each is using their own personal language. So Norman, that's really profound and beautiful. You're saying even if we're hypothetically praying in the own same language, it's never actually the same language because it's always being translated through the lens of our own experience and through our individual relationship with God, which is really beautiful. Even thinking back to the, the Tower of Babel text that it was it's said in the beginning that they were all praying in the same language. And Norman, you're saying with prayer, we're never actually praying in the same language. It's a beautiful idea. Deborah says, the community lens. I think it's really amazing to be able to attend services in synagogues in different countries and to feel connected because everyone is saying the same prayers in the same language. Yeah, like I think about that too. Also, I think about that in terms of the language of nusach, the language in terms of melody, um, that you know, the ability to not only walk into any synagogue anywhere and to recognize the language of the prayer if it's in Hebrew, but the melody is that you could even be in different countries sometimes and be hearing those same melodies that if prayer is about, if what we value in prayer is that universal experience, then the language or Hebrew as the holy language might be the container for that experience. If prayer is really about the individual, then maybe we don't, we don't need that shared universal language. Okay. I encourage you to keep putting your um, comments into the chat. Just so grateful for them. I wanna dive into now um, and see you've all started raising what are some of the different values, um, the different things at tension of what you think is essential to prayer. And then based on that, um, based on that, how it might affect it, how you would rule about whether what prayers should be in Hebrew or don't have to be in Hebrew, do they need to be in words at all? But now I actually wanna take a look at the sources. So the first verse we're going to be looking at comes from the Mishnah. Let me just reorient my screen so that, oh, there we go. Um, the first source we're going to be looking at comes from the Mishnah. Okay, so what is the Mishnah? Here's where we're getting into it. So the Mishnah, um, you have the Torah, you have the five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, and there's a lot of stuff in the Torah. There's some genealogy, there's some nice stories, um, there is some law, but you certainly wouldn't go to the Torah if you were wondering how to keep Shabbat. It's like, you know, there's a verse here and there's a verse here and it's not, it doesn't really give you all the details. The Torah is not really a law book, I would per se. It, it contains all sorts of things. The Mishnah, which was compiled between 0 and 200 CE, was the first attempt to make a legal code from the Torah. Put that into the chat there. The Mishnah, 0 to 200 CE. Um, the Mishnah, keeping in mind, and really the Talmud for the time, I know we haven't gotten there yet, just keep in mind that they weren't written down until much later. They, it was an oral tradition that was being handed over orally. Um, the Mishnah is divided into six different orders. They're called Starim. Um, the Starim are Moed, which is dealing with time or holidays. Um, sorry, let me start. Well, really, I would say it starts with Zra'im which is um, Zerah is a seed. So Zra'im are all the books about agriculture. 
Moed is all the books about time or holidays. Then you have Nashim, which is women in Hebrew. It's all the books relating to women or vows, because it's things like marriage or divorce. Um, it has um, a book that's specifically about the Sota woman in the Parsha, the woman who's accused of adultery. That's Nashim. Um, and then there's another order that's called Nizikin, which means damages. Nizikin is all the sections that are dealing with um, basically law, court, civil society. If you're a bull, um, gore is my bull, um, property boundaries, things like that. That's Nizikin. And then the last two starting, I feel a little bit re relevant, less relevant to our lives because they're, they're um, tractate, they're starting that specifically had to do with the time of the temple, um, temple being destroyed in 70 CE. So the, it, there's one on um, Kedoshim, which is like things that are relating to things that are consecrated or holy or sacrifices. And another setter, another order that's called Taharot, things that are relating to purity and impurity laws. Um, purity and impurity, meaning am I in a state that is pure that I can bring a sacrifice to the temple? Am I in a state that is impure that I can't bring a sacrifice to the temple? So for the most part, um, with the exception of the practice of Nida today, of women going to the mikvah once a month, around their period. With the exception of Nida laws, purity and impurity laws have basically fallen out of practice now that the temple isn't still standing. So in general, the starim of um, Kedoshim and Taharot feel a little bit less directly relevated to our lives. Whereas the tractates like um, Zeraim, which contains um, the tractate Brachot, which is all around blessings and prayer, or um, the Shabbat, like Shabbat and Yom Kippur and Sukkah, those would all be in Moed, or marriage and divorce would be in Nashim, Nazikin, how to like have a good, healthy civil society, courts of law, death penalty, that would be in Nazikin. All of that has content um, that I think is really relevant to our lives. I'm going to pause there, um, and I'll just say one more thinking, thing about that. Um, it, the Mishnah was said to be compiled by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, um, and again, that's coming together in the, the um, between zero and 200 CE. So any questions on the Mishnah there? You can feel free to put that into the chat. And if you're um, typing the questions, I think I'll go on, um, but feel free. I won't be reading, I won't stop in the middle of the next text to answer, but if you have questions um, about the Mishnah, feel free to put them into the chat. Oh good, so Deborah, you're saying what is the Mishnah Torah? Um, Rambam did write that and we're gonna get to that in the next class. So if I don't, if I don't explain, I'm sure I'll explain in the next class, but if I don't, please feel free to ask that question next time, okay? Okay, so feel free to put other questions in the chat um, and when we take a pause, I'll go back and I'm happy to answer them. So the next text we're gonna be looking at comes from the Mishnah of Sota. Um, so this is specifically the tractate that um, deals with the question, interestingly, of um, the woman who's accused of adultery. Um, and she's supposed to be, she's called a sota, and she's supposed to be subjected to this certain like humiliating, humiliating ritual to see if she actually was adulterous or not. But interestingly, in this um, tractate, there is a section that's all about the language of prayer. So that's what we're going to be looking at. So it says here, Elu um, ne'amrin bekoloshon. These texts, these specific prayers can be said in any language. Yes, I will absolutely, Mimi, send, send the six orders. That's a great idea. Okay, so these texts can be said in any language. The section about the Sota, the Ma'aser declaration. So the section about the Sota is the section that the um, priest administers to the Sota to say, you know, to say, if you're guilty, then all this stuff is going to happen. And if you're not guilty, then this stuff's going to happen. When he says that ritual, there's a specific text he's supposed to say. The Ma'aser declaration, that's a specific declaration that the Torah says that when we do our tithing, when we separate a tenth of our property to give it to the temple or to give it to the poor, there's a specific declaration before God we're supposed to say. Um, the reading of the Shema, that's the Shema we all know and love. The tefillah, when the Mishnah uses the word tefillah, so it literally says, you can see here in the Hebrew, tefillah, um, it's always referring to the prayer that is the Amidah, the standing individual prayer. The grace after meals, so that's the blessing after the meals. The oath taken by witnesses and the oath taken by a bailey. Um, all of those, according to the Mishnah, can be said in any language. Just want to say that again. According to the Mishnah, all of these specific things, but, but most important, I think, for us today, the Shema and the Amidah can be said in any language. That's huge. The following must be said in Hebrew, the holy tongue. So it says here, 
um, Lashon Hakodesh, right? Why Hebrew? It's the holy tongue. And then it gives all these various things. I'm not going to get into all of them. I'll just give you a sense. The Bikurim reading. So that's the reading when you bring your first fruits to the temple. And um, there's a specific text the Torah says you're supposed to say. The Chalitza decoration. Again, I'm not going to get into a specific text. The blessings and the curses. Again, these are all written out in the Torah. Um, there were tribes that were continuing to recite these blessings and curses. And that had to be said in Hebrew. The priestly blessing. So this is interesting. You know the priestly blessing. Um, so they're saying that blessing, um, which is written in the Torah, it's a blessing that um, oftentimes parents will give to their kids on a Friday night. They're saying that specifically, or the blessing, or the priestly blessing when um, it, at services, when the if you've ever been to a service where the priests get up and do the strange thing with their hands and you're not supposed to be looking, or if there are any, I don't know if there's any koanim on, on this phone call. Um, there we go. We got, we got a couple right there. Um, so that blessing apparently has to be said in Hebrew. Um, and these various other blessings, the sections that are read by the king, the blessing of the high priest, the section of the, um, that you say with the calf of the broken neck, you're supposed, there's a whole ritual you're supposed to do. If there's someone who died and you don't know who did it, that all the community members are supposed to come together to say, we, there's a, uh, to say, we don't know who did this murder, but it's sort of like on all of us and the declaration of the anointed priest who leads the people to war and addresses the truth. So according to the Mishnah, there is a section of blessings that can be said in any language, including the Shema and the Amidah. And then there's all these other various blessings that can be said in any language. And so the question that I would put to you that I don't, um, you can feel free to put it in the chat, but I am going to move on for now because I want us to see one more text before we really pause. The question I would start putting to you is, um, are you surprised? Are you surprised to find out that according to the Mishnah, you can say the Shema and the Amidah in any language? And the other question I would ask you to think about, um, I know that this is a long list, so it's a little bit hard to make sense of it, but the next step to do would be to try to make sense of this list and to figure out, well, why these things have to be in, um, you know, Safat HaKodesh, Lashon HaKodesh, in, in the Holy Hebrew language, but all these other things can be in any language you want. So that would be the other thing. And if you have thoughts about that, feel free to start thinking about that or putting it in the chat. So that's according to the Mishnah. We're going to look at one more text together before we take a pause. This next text is the Tosefta. What is the Tosefta? The Tosefta is the less well-known friend of the Mishnah. I'm sure some of you have heard the word Mishnah before. Um, the Tosefta is actually existing concurrent with the Mishnah. So it's material from the same time period. It's also from zero to 200 CE. Um, it's organized very similarly to the Mishnah in that you see that there was a Mishnah Sota, there was a tractate on Sota. And you see here, there's a Tosefta that is also on tractate Sota in the same way that there's a tractate of Mishnah on Shabbat. There's a tractate of um, Tosefta also on Shabbat. Um, the main difference is that the Mishnah got codified into the Mishnah for whatever reason, and the Tosefta is sort of like other material um, that just didn't get codified for whatever reason that, in that way. Um, so it has, I would say, sort of like slightly less standing, but still not, because it's still from that period of time, from 0 to 200 CE. So oftentimes when scholars are researching a specific topic, they'll want to learn both the Mishnah and the Tosefta on that topic to see what are the similarities and what are the differences. And so even here, you're going to see what are the similarities between the Tosefta and the Mishnah and what are the differences. I want to just say one more thing I'm remembering. Um, so I said that, the, and this is, um, this is true both for the Mishnah and the Tosefta. So I said that Mishnah and Tosefta, how is it organized? It's organized into the six different starim. Those are the one around um, agriculture, time, women, damages, holy consecrated things, and purity and impurity. And then those starim, those orders are subdivided into smaller tractates. That's really key. So for example, if you go to um, Moed, so that's the order that's all about time and holidays, there's a tractate on Shabbat, a tractate on, called Yoma, Yom Kippur, a tractate on Sukkah um, that, are, that are part of that larger. So you have like the bigger order and then the subdivided tractate or Masechet would be how I would say it, Masechet or tractate. Okay, again, if you have questions, feel free to put them into the chat because we're doing two purposes. You're going deep into the content and getting the history lesson at the same time, so it's a lot. Okay, so here's the Tosefta on Sota. So what does this say? Blessings, Hallel, 
So blessings are saying any blessings that you say. Hallel, what is hallel? That's like the extra um, singing celebratory service you say on special holidays. Hallel, Shema, and Tefillah again. Tefillah always is referring to the Amidah when the Mishnah Tosefta is saying this. May be said in any language. So that sounds really familiar to the Mishnah. Rabbi says, so in the Hebrew there, Rabbi Omer, when the um, Tosefta says Rabbi Omer, that's always referring to Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Rabbi says, um, I say that the Shema can only be said in Hebrew. So now we get something interesting and new. On one hand, you have the Tosefta agreeing with the Mishnah and saying a much shorter abridged list than we saw in the Mishnah. But here are these four things, the two, you know, two that we really care about for sure. Shema and Amidah can be said in any language. But now we have Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who has a lot of standing, saying, actually, the Shema specifically, he's pulling out the Shema for some reason from that list, which is interesting why. He's saying specifically the Shema, I say that it can only be said in Hebrew. So that is in contradiction to the Tosefta, the opening position of the Tosefta, and the Mishnah. And now he's giving a reason. He's saying, why does the Shema have to be said only in Hebrew? He brings a verse. What is the verse? It says in the Shema, in the Torah, where it tells us to say the Shema, it says, and these things, um, and these words. So let's just actually look at that. So here's the Torah in the book of Deuteronomy where we get the Shema. It comes right from the Torah, which is so incredible to see it. Um, so Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Here's the Ve'ahavta. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Okay, and then I'm going to look at the Hebrew here. And these words that I'm commanding you today should be on your heart. I'm going to read one more line. You should teach them to your children. And you should speak of them. You should speak of them. In your sitting, in your house. And you're walking on the way. And you're lying and you're getting up. So what is Rebbe saying? Rebbe says, in a portion of the Shema, in the Torah, where the Torah tells us to say the Shema, it says, these words. So what does he mean? These words, literally these words. It has to be these exact words in the holy language that the Torah is written. It can't be some substitute words that are, you know, same content, but a different language. So Rebbe is reading the Torah there really literally and saying, when the Torah says, these words, it has to be those exact words. And so specifically for that reason, the Shema has to be said in Hebrew, whereas other things like the Amidah and other things can be said in any other language. Okay, I want to pause there. Um, to hear what do you think about that, um, any questions there. So if we just had the Mishnah and the Tosefta, basically it seems like Shema and Amidah can be said in any, any languages, but Rebbe Yehuda Hanisi, a major rabbi, the editor of the Mishnah, is saying actually um, the Shema can only be said in Hebrew. Why? Because it brings this verse, these words. Okay, what do we think here? So Howard. The prayers that are communal or public declarations must be said in Hebrew, regardless of one's native language, so that all Jews will say them and understand them in the same way. Good. The prayers that are individuals' conversations with God or with themselves can be said in any language because only God and the individual praying need to mutually understand them. Good. So, Howard, you're doing the work of helping us figure out with the Mishnah, also with the Tosefta, but certainly with those long groupings in the Mishnah of why these group of prayers you think um, can be said in any language, but these group have to be said in, in uh, Lashon HaKodesh, in the he Hebrew communal language. Amazing. Um, Rebbe's reasoning is based on considering the recitation of the Shema as a communal responsibility rather than an individual responsibility. Good. So do we think about the Shema as essentially being a, in, a responsibility on the individual, a prayer of the individual, or it's actually the Shema, as I was saying earlier, I guess I did sort of say that, that the Shema is, is a communal obligation or something that's connecting us to the community through the recitation of the Shema, and therefore we want to say it in the communal language of Hebrew. Good. Arnold said the Shema is a communal declaration. Oh, and so Mary, Marian, I assume you're saying for the priestly blessing, wouldn't you be using home language? I assume that's what you're saying, because we had been saying that the priestly blessing, according to the Mishnah, had to be in Hebrew, and you're saying, but that doesn't make sense. It feels like if you're talking to your children, you would want it to be in the language that they understand. Rochelle says, there seems to be a struggle to understand that one is part of a community, even when that community is not present, and seems to be the point of the discussion in the first place. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. Even when I'm, a, even if I'm not with that community, 
um, either because that community precedes me in time, it's my ancestors, or I'm davening by myself, and I'm still trying to plug into that community, either going back in time or extending out, and am I doing that by saying the words of the community? Oh, there they are, have to, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So Norman says, Rebbe's opinion is convincing that the Shema should be recited in Hebrew. So you like that he brought that verse and it says these words, so it has to be these words, and yet it is overruled um, by the Mishnah, meaning that you could say it in any language. Good. So the question there, Norman, is what, what was the other value that it was so, what were the competing values there such that it was important enough to the Mishnah and the Tosefta to ultimately say that the Shema can be said in any language. So let's go on to see some of the other texts to play out. What are the other values um, at play there? Okay, good. Okay, now we're getting into the Talmud. What is the Talmud? We have the Mishnah from zero to 200 CE. The Talmud, um, the Talmud, and I really, you'll notice I have a lot of slippage in my language here. I tend to use the word Talmud and Gemara interchangeably. Um, there's a way in which Talmud is sort of the Hebrew word. It comes from the word lil mod to learn, or lil med to teach. Gemara comes from the Aramaic word, which also means to learn. So they share a similar root, but Tamara is the, ta Talmud is the Hebrew word, Gemara is the Aramaic word. I tend to use them interchangeably. There is a technical difference that, um, so you have the Mishnah from zero to 200 CE. Now the rabbis of the Mishnah, um, even though they were sort of making the first attempt at a legal code, they spoke very tersely and in shorthand, and even they assumed a lot of knowledge. And so even the later rabbis, when they came along, they didn't always understand what the other rabbis were um, referring to. So for example, um, you know, it says in the opening um, section of the tractate brachot, from what, time when, from what time can a person say shema? And then it gives an, a various answers. And so then the Gemara that comes in and says, well, what do you mean by Shema? And what do you mean by time? And what do you mean by morning? And what do you mean by evening? So the Gemara is the later rabbi's attempt to make sense of, to dissect, to explain, to apply the Mishnah. So all those things that are sort of in the way that the commentators we were looking at from last week, why I was saying the work I would have you do is to read the Torah and ask a thousand questions. What doesn't make sense? What don't you understand? And then the commentators are trying to explain it. The Torah and the Gemara have a similar relationship. It's like those later rabbis would approach the Mishnah and say, well, what are all the things that I don't understand in this text? What are all the things that are complicated? And then the Gemara is the commentary on the Mishnah. Technically, um, you have the Mishnah, the Gemara is the commentary, and the Talmud refers to the Mishnah and the Gemara together. Um, but me personally, and often other people, I think just sort of use Gemara and Talmud interchangeably. The Mishnah is zero to 200 CE. The Gemara um, is written, I would say, not written, but compiled roughly between 200 and 500 CE. Now there's, it's, here's an important thing. There's actually not one, but two Talmuds. We have two Talmuds. One is the Yerushalmi Talmud. So that's what we're going to look at right here. Um, that was lit, written um, in the sort of like in the land of Israel. And then there was a Talmud that was written in exile in Babylonia, which is the Babylonian Talmud. Um, the Yerushalmi was redacted a little bit earlier. That was more like 200 to 400 CE. I'll put this into the chat. Yerushalmi, 200 to 400 CE. Um, and Babylonian was more like 200 to 500 CE. So Yerushalmi was redacted a little earlier. You would think that the Talmud that was written in the land of Israel would be our central Talmud and maybe the exile Talmud would have less importance. It's actually quite the opposite, that it's the Babylonian Talmud um, that has become the much more studied Talmud. One of the main reasons for that um, is the Babylonian Talmud has been much more heavily edited than the Yerushalmi Talmud and it's much easier I'm putting easier in quotes. It's still very difficult to learn, but it's much easier to learn than the Yerushalmi. It's much more, again, I'm putting it in quotes, accessible. Um, so in general, when people are referring to the Talmud, oftentimes they're referring to the Babylonian Talmud, which was redacted a little bit later, 500 CE, um, and was sort of made a little bit more flowing and accessible than the Yerushalmi, but there are both of them. And they follow the same organization as the Mishnah, that there are um, tractates. Okay. Um, if there are questions on any of that, feel free to put that into the chat. 
Um, okay, so let's look at the, we'll look at the Yerushalmi and then we'll, we'll end there and then we can continue this uh, a bit next week. So, Kriyat Shema, we're really going to focus on Kriyat Shema, Dichtiv Vedibar Tambam. Kriyat Shema, what does the Mishnah say? Kriyat Shema says it can be said in any language. But the Mishnah didn't give us a reason why it could be said in any language, right? Rebbe gave us a reason why it can't be said in every language, but the Mishnah didn't give us a reason why it can be said in any language. So that's sort of interesting, Howard, that was part of your question. So Kriyachma, the implied question is why can you say it in, why could, how do you know that you can say it in any language? That you shall speak to them. And sort of this goes back to some other people's um, references there. If prayer is something that we're supposed to be spoken, presumably it should be spoken in a language that people actually speak. So you should say Shema in the language that you speak, the dibartamban, that you should speak them. And so therefore, say Kriyat Shema in the language that you speak, that is your language. Rebbe Omer, Rebbe says, Omer ani Kriyat Shema, eno namar elabilashona kodesh. This is what we saw from the Tosefta. Rebbe says, and I just want to point out that phrasing, um, normally when it, it says, the Rebbe's name comes first, and then the word Omer, Rebbe Omer. It's showing you that he's going to disagree with the opinion that came before, which is very Gemara. There's constant disagreeing. So Rebbe says, I say that Shema can only be said in the holy language, meaning Hebrew. My Tama, what's the reason? This is a very Gemara phrase, trying to figure out, ask. The Gemara is all about truth. It's all about questions and clarifying. So it's like, okay, well, we had the... Um, we have the statement of Rebbe, but now we understand, well, why does Rebbe think that? So we're going to say, the Gemara is going to say in its Gemara language, Ma Tama, what's the reason? Because the Torah says, quoting a verse, very Gemara, quoting a verse, these words, you have to say these words, meaning these words. So we have a debate between bringing one verse that's focusing on because it says you should speak them, it teaches me Shema can be said in the language that you speak, in your own language. Whereas Rebbe says, no, I'm focusing on a different verse. I'm focusing on the verse that says these words, and from this other verse, I'm saying it can only be said in the language was written in Hebrew. So you see there's this machloket, there's a debate, and it's all based on how, which part of the verse you want to focus on. Now we're going to get a story, an amazing story. Rabbi Levi bar Chaita went to Caesarea. He heard voices reading the Shema in Greek. He wanted to stop them, which should be fine, right? He heard voices reading the Shema in Greek. If Rebbe Levi is familiar with the Mishnah and Tosefta, right? Rebbe, Rebbe Yehuda Nasi is actually, as Howard said, is the minority opinion. The halakha, the law doesn't follow him. The Mishnah and the Tosefta both say, you can read the Shema in any language. So Rebbe Levi goes to Caesarea. He hears I mean, he heard them reading the Shema in Greek, and he wanted to stop them. He gets mad at them, even though technically they're doing something that's fine. Rabbi Yossi heard this and got angry. So Rabbi Yossi heard that Rabbi Levi was going around being upset that people were saying the Shema in Greek and getting upset about it. And then Rabbi Yossi got upset. And what does Rabbi Yossi say? Why does he get angry? He said, here's what I'm saying. Should a person who doesn't know Hebrew not say the Shema at all? What does Rabbi Yossi care about? I think Rabbi Yossi doesn't only care about meaning making. It's not only that he's saying, or it might not even be that he's saying at all. I don't know that Rabbi Yossi is saying, well, you have to understand the text that you're saying. He's saying, if you say that Shema can only be said in Hebrew, then you're closing off prayer to all of the people who don't speak Hebrew. What about all these Greeks who only speak Greek? They never learn the Hebrew language. Are you saying that they shouldn't have access to prayer? So Rabbi Yossi's argument there is not, not only or not even um, about meaning and relationship to God. It's about who has access to prayer. If you want people to have access to prayer, then you have to let them. So Howard, this goes back to your question, perhaps. Then if you want people to have access to one of the central prayers that is tying the, all of the Jewish people together, then you have to let them say it in a language that they actually can say. Because otherwise, you're just from the get-go saying you're not a part of this people. Tfila, the Amida, can be said in any language so that a person will know how to ask for his or her needs. We saw this in the comments there. So now it's giving us a reason. The Mishnah, so this is, what's the difference between the Mishnah and the Gemara? And the Mishnah sort of just said, Tfila in any language, the Amida in any language. But now the Gemara is interrogating and saying, well, why? What's the proof? How do we know? What are the other opinions? And so now we're getting a reason. Why can the Amidah be said in any language? We had a guess. The Mishnah didn't tell us explicitly. Why can the Amidah be said in any language? Because you're asking 
for what you need. And you have to, in order to ask for what you need, you have to be able to speak in the language you understand. The grace after meals, Birkat Amazon, also can be said in any language. Why? So that one will know whom one is blessing. So here, the Yerushalmi is giving us a reason that the Mishnah was not, it was not interested or not able to give us, that specifically, we, we hear the Amida because it's about your needs, your individual needs, and so you have to be able to ask for them. And you want, if you're giving gratitude to God, you have to be able to give gratitude in the language that you understand, because otherwise it's like, you know, if you're forced to say the blessing after meals and you don't actually understand what you're saying, is that really going to be real gratitude? Okay. I'm going to pause there just for the sake of time, um, but knowing we're going to pick back up with this text um, and the Talmud and use that to fuel us into the, the sort of the Rishonim that'll be from 1000 to 1500 CE. I know that there's more. If you have questions on this, feel free to jot them down for yourself and we can start next class with um, questions on this text and any other questions about Mishnah, Gemara, Talmud, Babylonian, Yerushalmi. Okay, handing it over. Thank you. So just a general question, since we did skip the Mishnah in my, my day school. Um, do, do, Mishnahs in, do Mishnahs ever give reasons for um, their decisions? Or is it like, is it very similar to what you just showed us, that it's really just a discussion about the law and that the Gemara is the one that gives the reasons? It's not, it, we, yeah, it's a great question. It's not, it's certainly not unheard of for a Mishnah to give a reason for a ruling. Um, it definitely can happen, but I would just say in general, the Gemara is much more interested in going more into depth, multiple reasons, exploring multiple perspectives. So you might get a one reason or one opinion, um, like one opinion gets a reason, um, but you're much more likely to get those opinions. And the Gemara is much more interested in also proving things, that whatever the Mishnah says, then the Gemara is not necessarily going to take it at face value and say, well, how do we know that's true? well, we can prove it from this or from this, from this, whereas the Mishnah might just leave it as a statement and move on. Well, hopefully um, you've all enjoyed this. If it's your first time in the Mishnah or in the Talmud, then you have a great teacher who's taken you in. Um, it's a deep pool. We're in the shallow end. You get very deep. So we'll, we'll, stay, we'll stay in different parts of the pool because we're exploring. And um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to share was I was never told when I was studying the, the Talmud that when they quote rabbis arguing with each other, they really weren't in the same room. In fact, some of them didn't even live at the same period of time. And what's really, and, and another thing is many of them had weird relationships with each other, were married to the, their sisters, the sister of someone else, um, not their own sisters. But, and so in studying the Talmud, what makes it very interesting is uh, the personalities. Uh, they generally have their positions like, uh, Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals. They, you can almost guess if you see their name, which side they may come down on. Um, and there's politics and personal relationships. And then there's a lot of history because they, the, they don't live at the same time. They weren't in the same room. And I think to me, that makes the Talmud richer. But I was never taught that till, and learned that till later in life. So I wanted to share that. Yeah, all right, please. I love that. And please make sure I want to come back to that in the next class, talking more about what actually, how the Talmud is organized a little more and, who, and what is on a page of Talmud. And I'll just say, um, Hadar has a whole online Jewish learning platform um, if, where there's all these courses that are available so you can do your own learning. And there's a class that's an amazing class by Rabbi Talia Adler called Talmudic Personalities. It's a 10 session course um, focusing on the different personalities and the stories of the rabbis. So if you want to go a little bit further in depth with the stories of the rabbis of the Gemara, that's a really great way to do it. But I guess I'll ask you, uh, Rav, Rav Avi, maybe we could find a resource to share like we did in our first class with the commentators, with the rabbis, which I think it's out there, which shows the rabbis, you know, um, the, the Rishonim and the Aharonim, the first rabbis, the later, uh, and um, when they lived and maybe their relationship. I've seen it somewhere where it has like how they're related, maybe um, if they're related or whether one was a teacher of the other. And I'll share that with the group so you have that as a resource. But yeah, it's always good to learn more. So Hadar has great classes. I recommend that you take them and enjoy. With that, happy Tuesday. A few more days to Rosh Hashanah. Tomorrow we're off. We'll see you on Thursday. And we'll Shana jump into Tevya. Shana Tova, uh, Rav Avi, and to everybody if I don't see you. Sweet New Year. Keep safe. Thank you, guys. Bye.